everybody, everybody, everybody watching around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us for the virtual rendezvous. I am Eric Fulmer. I am a long time working arborist, also a recreational tree climber. I am a canopy research climber and I am a consulting arborist. So this webinar is going to be about tree risk assessment, uh, specifically geared towards climbers and pre-climb inspection, but it's all connected. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I have some slides, so I'll show some slides, and we're also going to go outside and look at some trees live. So uh, I broke, broke it down to three kinds of tree assessment. You, you, you assess a tree for failure. Usually that is something you do for a client, and you're looking at the tree, and what is the target if it fails, and what are the chances this tree or the part of the tree will fail within a time period usually a year. Then you typically also look at the mitigation of the risk. If there's a high risk, what can you do to create a low risk, uh, you know, short of removing the tree? This is something, if you have a, a tree, you, you tend to go back to the same tree and climb, or you have a climbing grove where you do your recreational classes and stuff. This is what you'll do there. You take a good close up look at the trees and, and go over every detail. Then we also have a work in arborist pre-climb inspection. The arborist shows up on the job. Sometimes they have very little information. They're told, go there, do this. So they will uh, inspect the tree. They look for hazards. And the uh, question in mind is, how do we do this job? OK, if, if there's some issue, there's a high risk of climbing, then you got to think, how can you do it? Do you need to get a bucket truck? Do you need to get a crane, whatever? Maybe it's strong enough for you to climb, but it's not strong enough for, enough for you to roll bottle. So then you have to make some adjustment. And then for the recreational climber, it's really simple. Your question is, is this tree safe to climb at this moment? Uh, if the answer is yes, there you go. If the answer is no, walk away and find another, find another tree. Uh, so when you're climbing, of course, your weight hangs on the rope and that is a load on the tree. That is relatively small, a small load compared to other forces. So you might look at a tree and say, oh, I only weigh so much, it can hold me. Well, you wanna look at the other forces to make sure it can support those. One of those is the shock load. If you drop a feet or two, or you slip off a branch and the rope catches you, the load is several times your weight, it goes up a lot and uh, for an arborist you also got to look at at the uh, the load if you're doing raking you're lowering branches you know that's a lot more load than your weight or if you set up a speed line to, to let the branches run out to, a, to a, a landing area then that's a lot of load now if you're a recreational climber besides you being able to climb the tree the tree being strong enough to withstand a shock load you also maybe want to do a traverse. If you do a traverse from one tree to another, the loads get a lot bigger. Or if you do a zip line, if you do a swing, anything like that. So then you got to look at the options you have in that case. Uh, estimating shock load. This is complicated mathematically and there's no simple formula and it gets, it depends a lot on the stretch of the rope. So, uh, Don Blair, he published this, this book years ago, Arborist Equipment, where he has a lot of good information. He came up with this. For every foot a falling object gains, it gains a unit of weight plus one. The unit is the original weight. So you weigh 150, and then, you know, you got another one, you, you got 300, you got another one, you got 450. So this is not exactly right, but it shows you the magnitude of multiplication that you got to be thinking of. Now here we have my friend Vauda doing a traverse in the, uh, in the mountains of Costa Rica. You know, he loves to do those and he's really good at sitting the ropes. And when you do that, you gotta be aware that the load at each point of the two tying points is much more than the weight of the climber, depending on the angle. So here's an example that illustrates that vector forces, if you have a hundred kilo and you have two lines going up at a 45 degree angle, each line is only supporting 54 kilos. So the total weight is, is pretty close to 100. Now, when you get, get out to almost horizontal, all of a sudden each side has a load of 574 kilos. So that's a lot. So that's something 
you know, you, you might have a tie-in point. It's strong enough for you to tie in your climbing rope. It's not strong enough for doing a traverse. And uh, if you saw Normo's presentation, he's talked about doing a high line. If he has a cat in a dead tree, it's, it's not safe to climb. He sets a high line when he can between two trees, ties into that in the middle and goes up. Then these forces come into play also and you get a lot of force on the tying points. So when you wanna do a pre-climb inspection, there's a typical flow of steps, step by step. You look at the whole tree, you look at the site, then you look at any specific hazards that are involved with this tree. And then you do a close up inspection at the tree. You always go 360, you always walk all the way around, look at it from all sides. Start from the base roots, base of trunk, trunk and branches. And then for the climb, you need to select a tying point that's strong enough. So we'll go over that. For example, when you look at the tree in profile from a distance, you might see a gap in the canopy. That gap is a sign of increased risk. So that branch that's pointing out over the street, it has a high risk of failure because normally branches will share the space, they will share the light. So something happened, it's coming down and that the branch you wanna watch out for. You wanna take a closer look, you don't wanna tie into that. If you have an increased lean, uh, then that is, uh, is a problem a lean usually not a problem a tree can be leaning if it always grew that way and it developed enough wood and enough strong root system to support itself that might be okay if you have an increased lean you have a problem so in this case for example you can look around and see sign that has increased if it's not really apparent here was a uh, a leaning oak tree somebody told me it seems like it's been leaning more I'll take a look at it well, I looked down at the base and I could see there was a little indentation where it's grown up against the deck. So I asked him, well, how long has this deck been here? Oh, it's been like that for years. So, okay, well, you know, there's been movement there. There's a gap there, so there's an increased lean. So this is unfortunately a removal. Now, uh, geotropism, that refers to the fact that some trees, the leader will go, always go opposite the force of gravity. So if you have a tree that started leaning, and then the lean stabilized. It could be it came over during a rainstorm where the soil was saturated. Then the wind died down, it dried up, and you know it's not going anywhere. And then from there on, the tip grows straight up. You will see a corrected lean. So that's a good sign. You said top is correcting. That means it has been stabilized for a long time. This is uh, my friend down in Costa Rica. You see a coconut palm. The root ball falls down. From there on, the growing point goes straight up. You know that's not. Always the case, coconuts tend to go in weird, weird um, curves and stuff, but that illustrates it. So when you look at specific risk to the climber, of course, deadwood is, uh, is a big issue, not just the uh, dead tying point, but the deadwood that's gonna be knocked loose and come down on your head or you swing into it. Uh, then you look for insects. If you if you have to climb something, if it's a job or research or something, and you see, you know, you can you can put on a head net that'll protect your head if there's insects, that at least you will you won't be stung in the face. You can see and you can come down if you get attacked. And uh, an air route that refers to the fact that if you're like, for example, in the tropics especially, you have a lot of vines and stuff near the trunk. If you go up a little ways out from the trunk through the air, you're not going to be constantly next to all that vegetation in the trunk that might hide some critters. Animals, birds, cavities, watch out for cavities, make sure there's nothing living in there. And of course, power lines, always check for that. Uh, and then again, recreational tree climber, as power lines, don't climb it. Um, you know, tree workers, well, it depends. You know, you stay within certain distances, depending on what's, how you're certified and keep it in mind. And then of course, weather, like, uh, you know, during thunderstorms, you don't want to climb. You know, trees are typically the high point in the landscape and they can be attracted to lightning. Uh, you know, rain, you may or may not want to climb. Uh, wind, you know, maybe, it might be, sometimes it's fun to get blown around, but you just be aware of the, the loads a lot stronger. Of course, there's any power line at all near, you don't want to, you don't want to be, be up there in the rain because, you know, of course, the rain, the water conducts electricity. Uh, so some of these specific risk is uh, deadwood. If something is dead, 
you know, here's an example of a uh, of pine removal, too dead to climb, get a bucket truck. And uh, you assume that when, when something is dead, that it loses its strength rapidly. You know, sometimes it feels solid, it hasn't been dead that long, but there's things happening inside the wood. And that has been studied and it, it depends what the tree died from. For example, trees that are being killed by emerald ash borers or out here on the West Coast, the Southern Oak Death, they, decay much faster and there's chemical things going on that they lose their strength as soon as they're dead, even before they're dead. If you have a, have a tree, maybe most of the canopy is dead, it's still green, well, there's still there's changes going on in the wood. So be really careful with climbing those. Okay, here's an example of uh, a not very friendly ants. I got stung by these. These are, are in Central America and South America. This is a very painful sting. And uh, this is something to watch out for. So that's a good idea to, to not put your hands where you can't see. Uh, and there's, there's snakes that climb also in the tropics. These little eyeless vipers, they will hang out on, on a branch looking for little birds and prey, but if they get disturbed, they might strike, they are poisonous. And this is what I talked about, the trunk route versus the air route. If you are right in the middle of all those vines and stuff, there's more chance of you running into a uh, you know, a uh, snake or something else. Now, so here, here, there is a wasp nest and wasp nest is, uh, you know, typically they disturbed and they come right at you. So you don't want to climb a tree with those here. I was climbing a tree and uh, there was a huge wasp nest in the tree next to it. And the branches were kind of intermingling. So when I went up, I put on a head net just in case the movement would disturb them and they'll come at me. And after a while, they didn't come out. There was no attack. Then I took out the head net and I was fine. So this head net, if you're climbing, uh, especially in tropics, it's a good, good thing to have. It's a small little thing. It folds up in a little circle. Like you can have it on your belt and you get attacked. You, you know, put it over your head and you, uh, at least your eyes will work. You might get stung pretty good on the rest of your body. Uh, birds, bird's nest. Well, it's not so much for your protection, but for the protection of the birds. You know, birds, most birds are protected if there are nests with, with uh, eggs or live nestlings. You don't want to climb it. Uh, these are two little uh, bald eagles in Michigan. Uh, you, you know, just for your information, I was not breaking the law. I was up there with a the research permit. And uh, they are pretty amazing. You see some of the uh, pieces of prey of things that they've been eating. Power lines, always watch for power lines. That goes for, uh, you know, any kind of climb. And like for, I guess, hey, you wanna climb for fun? Don't even climb if there's a power line nearby. You know, it's easy to miss if you don't take a really good look, you know, they are thin, they might be behind a bunch of foliage. So that's, uh, that's something you always check for. Uh, weather, so we all talked about that a little bit, like the, uh, the trees are the high point, they will attract the lightning. So, you know, way, lightning, wind, rain, or ice storms in some part of the country, you might not want to climb. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the more of close inspection of the tree. We start at the base. If you see mushrooms, uh, then you, you have um, a, uh, you have, Typically wood decay. These are on the left, it's armillaria, on the right is Ganoderma. And um, I wanted to go to the, uh, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a minute and check the boxes because I can't see in this view. Thank you, Eric. I do also see that we have uh, oh, Lawrence has a question or a Go raised hand, yeah. Lawrence and anyone else, please do put questions directly in so Q&A. It's a, an annual a cluster mushroom, Amelaria, and on the right, it's a Ganoderma. I think there are species of these type of wood decay and fungus all around the world. And you see those, there's wood decay inside the trunk. You gotta check it closer or maybe just walk away. Now I cannot advance the slide. Oh, 
Okay, here we go. So this is an example of Ganoderma. You will see the, see the fruiting body, which is a perennial. It stays on year round. And then you see the wood broke up higher. So there's gonna be internal wood going up the center of that tree, makes it a lot weaker. Uh, so when you see a uh, mound on the backside of the lean of a tree, we will see, you see this is like the root plate is moving. So this is a, a high risk. It's, it's a failure in progress. And uh, we have a tree where that was happening too, right here on the ground. So I am gonna go, I'm gonna go to Serena and she will uh, show us that. And uh, Tamala, can you switch to Serena? All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Maya. We're here at Merritt College uh, Landscape Horticulture Department. I'm here to talk about uh, some safety around climbing trees. So this here, um, if you find my green pointer, that's, that's my laser here. So this cypress tree, uh, the woman who manages the grounds here, she noticed that it was uh, leaning quite heavily. And normally when you, um, as Eric mentioned, when there's a lean, you're gonna see mounding um, in the back here, and then a depression of the soil here. You don't see it in this tree because the tree has stabilized now. The, the ground has dried um, and the tree, the tree is stable. But one way that you uh, could tell that you wouldn't want to be climbing this tree is the branches back here are actually growing into the ground. So that is not something that we're normally going to see in the landscape. So that would be a signal that this tree has moved. It's not very stable. Um, we don't want to climb this tree. Great. Okay, Thank we're you. Good. All right, so here we have that, that issue with the, with the root plate movement that we have with other, that other tree. Uh, we brought it down so the risk was removed and did the little wildlife thing. Ah. Okay, so this is just a close up of doing that uh, nesting cavity. You know, you cut out a section, hollow it out, and then drill a hole in the section and put that back on. Uh, so when you also look at the lower trunk, you're going to be looking at the cavities and cankers. And uh, cavities, you know, there are certain formulas you can use to evaluate them, but it's, it's a matter of how much sound wood is left. Is there enough to support the tree or is this a high risk tree? In this case, you have a big cavity inside the tree. The walls are thin and you also have openings in the walls. So this is becoming high risk. On the right, you have a uh, Chinese elm with uh, cankers, which is a disease that creates these diamond shaped uh, dead areas, but they're the wood is pretty solid behind left. So, you know, one or two of those is fine. Uh, once like in this case, you get a lot of them, then it weakens the trunk. There's not enough trunk left to support itself. And that's gonna fail. Okay, so looking from the trunk, you look up and what you look at in the canopy, you look at the distribution of branches. If they are spread around at different heights and different parts of the tree when you look at the circumference that's stronger if they all originate in the same place that's weaker and the aspect is the relationship between the size of the branches and the trunk so you don't want the branches to be very large as large as the trunk you want it to be about half the size or, or smaller that's stronger and then we look at of course any breaks and cracks and things like that we look at adventitious shoots these are shoots that originated right at the surface of the trunk. Maybe it was injured or exposed to light and they can become pretty big, but they are weakly attached. And uh, we look at bark inclusion, attachment, taper and end weight. I'll talk a little bit more about these. So here's an example of adventitious shoots. The tree has been topped, it's shooting from the top. And here's a cross section of what happened. You can see the decay goes straight down the trunk from the, from the cut. And the, the shoots are very weakly attached. There's only a little bit of, of wood there. 
and they might become big. They might become so big that they look that you can climb them. But if you know they originated like this, yeah, there's a problem. Also an example of branch decay that you can't see. Uh, here I was trying to uh, set a line with a big shot in a, in a tree and I actually it was aiming for the branch you see on the right and I overshot it and got another branch and I climbed on that and when I got up I saw the branch I originally wanted was totally rotten. There's a just a thin layer of wood around there. So this is something you cannot see from the ground and that illustrates the point that you especially in a situation like this you want to do a bounce test. Once you set your anchor, it looks good. You you bounce up and down on the rope several times. And you don't want to be tied in while you're doing that because if something cracks, you want to be able to run out of the way. You know, sometimes you have tall trees in the tropics, you have vines, all kinds of stuff. You can't even see where you're tied in. You might want to put two, two people on bouncing at the same time to make sure it's solid. Uh, bar conclusion. Bar conclusion is uh, when there's a, a typically a narrow ankle attachment between two trunks and there's, they're not connecting all the way, there's box squeezed in between them. And then when you look like this one here, you look at the 90 degree view on the left, you'll see some bulges. That, these bulges show that the tree is reacting to the inclusion. It is weak, so the tree is trying to repair it by producing extra wood there, not always successful. So here's a typical bark inclusion failure. You see that black stuff is a bark inclusion, you know, that get hit with the wind and it cracks and then the whole thing comes down and, and typically will tear down a ways like that. A poor taper, you know, if, if a tree is pruned, so you remove all the inside growth, all the energy is gonna go to the end. You have poor taper, that's a weaker, weaker branch. Also, if a branch have that also creates heavy end weight. So with a lot of end weight, that's also a problem. Uh, now we're gonna talk about tie-in points. So a very general rules that uh, has been around for a while and I, it might've been originated with Tree Climbers International. I know they go by that. You want a tie into a branch of six inch diameter or more. And you wanna be no more than half the distance to the end of the branch. So uh, that is species dependent and and some species when you know your local species uh, you can uh, you can have uh, you can go go smaller but you have to know your species and I have a question do you have recommendations if you have to climb water sprouts so if typically when you get water sprouts from a topping cut you can have several and uh, I've done that quite a few times. I would um, tie into more than one. You can just, you know, divide your weight off between two and three of the, of the weak sprouts and then you might be okay. Uh, and I, I did that a lot when I, um, I worked with bald eagle research and sometimes the bald eagles will build their nest at the very top of the tree. The top might've broken up at one time or there's not much above them. And then there'll be shoots you know the nests are massive they may be six can be six feet all dimensions and then you got a bunch of shoots going up well sometimes those are pretty small and i don't trust them i've tightened two or even three just to get above the nest now then when we talk about a canopy anchor or a base anchor if you're climbing with a moving rope system you know, all your weight is at the tie-in point. If you're climbing with a stationary rope system and it's a canopy anchor, your weight is in that point. If it's a base anchor, your, your rope goes over a branch, tied off at the base, then that doubles the weight at the anchor point. Uh, what it also does, which is a little bit of advantage to it, it puts more rope in the system. So if you take a little fall and the stretch catches you, there's a lot more rope to stretch, and that's a good thing. Okay, so that's an example of that, that, uh, you know, double rope system or moving rope system to be correct. Here is my friend weighing 120 pounds, not moving, is 120 pound on the branch. 
In this other case here, eucalyptus, I weigh 190 pounds. I have a base anchor. When I'm not moving, there's a 380 pounds force at the tying point. Okay, this is all the slides I have. So I want to go in the field and look at some possible tying points in the trees we have out here. So uh, let's go back to Serena. All right, so here we have a coastal redwood, our iconic California tree. Uh, redwoods are known to have very weak branches um, as well as they tend to slope downwards. So this combination can make it a little riskier to be climbing redwoods. So one thing that you can do is you can actually tie into three branches uh, close to the trunk. So that's gonna spread out your, your weight across multiple branches, as well as um, if one of the branches does break, then your rope will catch on to the other branches. So it minimizes um, or lessens, lessens the risk of um, climbing, climbing these redwoods. All right, here we've got an oak tree. Oak trees are known to have very strong wood. Our rule of thumb for an oak is four inches in diameter for a tie-in point. So these are, this would be a good crotch to tie into. This would be a good crotch to tie into. This is another Another good one, travel up here. That is not gonna be very safe. Similarly with this one, too small. So again, that's a good, good crotch, good crotch, good, not good, not good. Back to you, Eric. So Eric made a cornet cut here at the top. Um, it's a jagged cut that mimics a break that you would see in, uh, in nature, a little more natural. Um, so that's going to give provide more surface area for decay organisms. Um, and then as well, he made a nesting cavity. So he actually did a bore cut and he looked into the dimensions that are needed for uh, local birds and he hollowed out that cavity, put the, um, the wood back um, and so there's nice little nesting cavity. So this is an alternative to completely removing the tree. Um, instead, we've left it here and it is uh, going to be habitat for, for the natural um, wildlife in the area. That's a very simplified customer, you know, step by step explanation of tree risk assessment. You know, there's a lot to it, and there's a uh, you can become certified in if you're a professional by studying. Uh, but anyway, I'll say we have a little more time. There was a question about Costa Rica. I would like to show a video of a project we did in Costa Rica to, to whet your appetite, or maybe join me on a future trip. OTS is a leader in research, education, and the responsible use of natural resources in the tropics. One minute, I think we're, uh, there we go, got some audio again. Research station is situated on Costa Rica's southern Pacific slope at about 1,000 meters elevation. It is surrounded by both primary and secondary pre-montane wet tropical forests with a high diversity of flora and fauna. This makes it a key site in the study of restoration ecology and biological corridors. A dedicated team of volunteer climbers came together to make a positive contribution toward the understanding of our environment. The team members have backgrounds in arboriculture, sustainability, biology, and architecture. The project was to extend the scope of research at Las Cruces 
by building and installing two canopy platforms in large forest trees. These platforms will make it possible for researchers and students to access the forest canopy. This will allow close-up monitoring of the canopy environment with the associated species and microclimate data. Up in the trees where we had sweet breeze and no mosquitoes. Mind your eyes, sparks and fly, but raise yours well then. Gonna build a new platform for mm. the jungle. Crack of dawn, from Sanyon, we're burning daylight. Found our tree way up high on the ridge line. Climbing gear piled up high at Castle Wilson. Son of a gun, we're gonna get this done in the jungle. Skilled local workers and the team built the platforms in the Las Cruces workshop. The main component was upcycled galvanized steel planting tables. These were reinforced and a solid substructure and railings were built with local materials. The railings will serve as attachment points for research instruments and 24-hour cameras. Safety was the main consideration on the construction site. Climbing was done with the best practices of modern technique and equipment. The material was hauled up into the trees using a progress capture system. The tree health and structure were evaluated to make sure they will serve as long-term support for the platforms. The trees were chosen for size, species characteristic, and biodiversity potential. No hardware was drilled into the trees. The platforms were suspended by cables with recycled tire sections as buffers, ensuring bark protection and freedom of growth over time. Climbing the line, two at a time, every morning. All in pipes, steel rope and cable. Clamp that wire, don't drop that nut if you're able. Son of a gun, I hope it rice on the table. Setting our lines with little orange twine while to shoot an arrow. Get up in the trees where we had sweet breeze and no mosquitoes. Mind your eyes, sparks and fly, Mauricio's welding. Gonna build a platform for the jungle. Tree Wolf Gang is a motley crew from all over. We got two Yanks, Kiko Britt, and the Romanios. Andrew Sawyer, Wilder, Jimmy Hale, and Roxy. Son of a gun, we had big fun in the jungle. Setting our lines with a little orange twine while to shoot an arrow. Get up in the trees where we had sweet breeze and no mosquitoes. The canopy platforms provide many opportunities to produce long-term studies of epiphyte communities, forest changes, and climatology. This allows OTS to stay on the cutting edge. The knowledge gained will ultimately serve Las Cruces' purpose of protecting primary forests and understanding how to reestablish complex ecosystems in secondary forests. <laughs>